Okay, guys, we're going to read a story. Actually, I'm going to read it, and you're going to follow along silently. Hopefully, I've got a copy in front of you so that you can read it. Um, it's called Miles by Jerry Spinelli. Um, it's just a piece of a book, all right? Um, it's just a piece. Um, <clears throat> so just start following along. On the first page, it says Miles by Jerry Spinelli. Some people try to run away from a problem. One boy runs straight into one. So I'm going to start on page 334, reading it. You can always stop it. You can rewind it and re-listen to a part, um, especially once you get to the questions. That's not a problem. Um, you know, even while I'm reading to you, you can stop it and rewind it and listen to something. If you realize that you're starting to drift off, rewind it. So here we go. I'm on page 334. I didn't make the baseball team. The coach said he already had a ninth grader for shortstop and an eighth grade second stringer, and I wasn't quite good enough to beat them out. I said I'd be willing to play another position. He said he had veteran ninth graders at all the positions. I told him I wanted to run. Oh, sorry. I told him I wanted to be a major leaguer someday. I told him I hit almost a 3:30 in little league last year. He looked impressed. He said that's the kind of spirit he likes to see. He said it's not that I don't have the talent. It's just that I need another year to grow. Too mature. In the meantime, he said he wants me to stay in shape. He said he'd like to see me go out for track. It'd be good for me, he said, and nobody gets cut from track. I tried out for the sprints. I figured that would help me be a better base stealer, but I was too slow for the sprints. I tried the half mile. It was too long to run full speed and too short to run slow. I couldn't figure it out. That's how I became a miler. At first, I wasn't too excited about it. I didn't see um, how running the mile was going to help me be a better shortstop. I was only doing it because the baseball coach was grooming me for next year. Then I saw a mile race on TV. Some great miler from England was running, and as he finished each lap, the announcer was screaming, He's on a record pace! He's on a record pace! Each lap, the people in the stands went crazier. On one side of the screen, they showed the world record time, and on the other side, they showed the runner's time. The whole stadium was standing and screaming like they were pushing him with their voices, and even though it was the last lap, in, uh, instead of going slower, he was going faster. I couldn't believe it. The stadium was going bananas, and he was flying, and the world record time and his time were getting closer and closer, and he broke the world record by three-tenths of a second. And even then, he didn't collapse or even stop. He just kept jogging another lap around the track, holding his arms up and smiling and waving to the cheering crowd. Even though it was Saturday, I went outside and ran ten times around the block. I'm on page 336. I turned out to be a pretty rotten miler. We had our first time trials, and I came in dead last. My time was six minutes and 47 seconds. The guy that broke the world record did it in less than three minutes and 50 seconds. To top it off, I threw up afterwards. And to top that off, the place where I threw up happened to be the long jump pit which didn't make the long jumpers too happy, but which the coach thought was just fine. He said now they had a good reason to jump farther than ever. But all that, it was nothing. It was all just peaches and cream compared to the worst part, the really, really bad thing. One of the people that beat me was named Marceline McAllister, the girl. I'm quitting, I told Peter Kim, who was out on the track team too, a half-miler. Why, he said. Why? You see who I lost to in the time trials? I wasn't watching. The girl. Uh, which one, he said. They're the other ones on the team, too, but uh, she's the only miler one. McAllister, I said. Marceline? Yeah, her. The one that plays the trombone? Yeah. He shrugged. So? So, I hollered. What do you mean, so? She's a girl, man. You ever lose to a girl? He said maybe I had a cramp. I didn't have no cramp. Maybe you just had a bad day. So what, I screeched. How bad could it be? She's still a girl. I got beat by a girl. I'm quitting. Then he started talking to me. He reminded me that some of the other girls on the team were doing better than last two. In fact, one of them was the second fastest sprinter in the 100-pound class. He said he heard that at our age, a lot of girls are better than boys because they mature faster. He said in another couple years, I'd probably beat her easy. And he reminded me that the baseball coach had his eye on me. 
Yeah, I said. He's really going to be impressed watching me lose to a girl. He didn't tell you to beat anybody, Peter said. He just said to keep it in shape. I tried to explain, Peter, all that stuff doesn't make any difference. The thing is, she's a girl, and a girl's a girl. You know what I'm saying? A girl. G-I-R-L. You understand me? Peter's expression changed. No, he said. I don't understand. I'm Korean, remember? Do what you want. He turned and left. Okay, I said. I won't quit. He kept walking. I called, hey, just don't tell Dugan. Peter, here, don't tell anybody. I'm on 338. It was a long, long track session. Every day we started with calisthenics. Then most days we ran around the whole school grounds, five times. Some other days we did intervals. That's where you run real fast, as hard as you can for a while, then walk for a while, a little or a while, then run fast again. Run, walk, run, walk. You just listen for the whistle to tell your legs when to start or stop. You'll never know how cruel a whistle is until you're walking after your tenth interval and you hear it blow again. As much as I hated practice, there was one good thing about it. You weren't running against anybody. There were no places, no first, no last. That's why I dreaded the first meet. Ham wanted to know when it was. Why? I asked him. Mom and I thought we'd like to come see it. See me lose, I said. I didn't tell them about the girl. I told you I'm just running to keep in shape for baseball. We just like to come and see you, that's all, he said. We came to you all your little league games, didn't we? That was different. I'm good at baseball. We don't care, he said. We, we don't come to see you be a star, just to play. Well, anyways, I said, the meet's away, which was true. It was at Mill Township. I came in last. By a lot. But the thing was, it didn't really bother me. And that's because on the bus over to the meet, I all of a sudden realized something. Even though I was running, I wasn't really in the race. If all, if all I was supposed to be doing was staying in shape for baseball, there was no use getting up all uptight about where I finished. I was actually running for the baseball coach, not the track coach. I was a baseball player disguised as a track runner. I didn't really want to break the world's record. I was no miler. I was a shortstop. It was a big relief when I thought about all that. It still might look to some people like I was losing to a girl, but inside I knew the truth. You can't lose if you're not racing. After the mile, the coach called to me. Herkheimer, you okay? Yeah, I said. I was still jogging. I was hardly puffing. I thought I'd do another couple laps around the grass. Really get in shape. Hold it, he said. Came over. Nothing wrong? Muscle pull? Dizzy? Nah, I told him. I'm okay. He looked at me funny. So why are you taking it so easy? I told him the whole thing, which, to be fair, I probably should have done for the first day of practice. I told him about the baseball coach, about being groomed for next year, about wanting to be a major league shortstop. I'm on page 340. He was nodding his head while I, was, I said these things. When I finished, he still kept nodding, looking at me. Then he stopped. He bent over so his face was right opposite mine. He didn't blink. His voice was hoarse, almost a whisper. What's your first name? Jason. Jason. Jason, when you're on my team, you run. And you run as well as you can. I don't care if you're slower than a turtle. You'll try your best when you're on my team. You will run as hard as you can every step of the way. Do you understand? I nodded. And next time I see you dogging it, you are no longer on my team. Understood? I understood. So much for taking it easy. So I did my calisthenics and ran my five times around the school and did my intervals, and I, I did try harder. In the second meet, I brought my time down to 6.30. I was still last. The calisthenics time was 6.15. In the next couple meets, I kept improving, but so did she. Our best miler, Floatmeyer, a ninth grader, only talked to me once. He said, when are you going to beat that girl? I tried, but by the middle of the season, she was still a good 10 seconds faster. Ham kept asking me about the meets. I kept telling him they were away. After a while, he got the idea and stopped asking. Then something happened that made me try even harder. We were racing Shelbourne, and they had a girl miler too, and she beat me. The next day at practice, I ran around the school six times. I did my calisthenics perfectly. 
Even after 15 intervals, I dared that whistle to blow again. Next meet, for the first time, I didn't come in last. I beat somebody, a kid on the other team. Peter saw I was trying harder. He started running with me at practice. He takes track seriously, like I take baseball. During my races, he would stand at the last turn with a stopwatch, and at each lap, he would call out my time and yell, Go, Jason! Go! Go! And on the last lap, coming off the final turn, he would yell at me, Sprint! Now! All out! Sprint! Now! Now! And he would be sprinting along on the grass with me. My times got better. I broke the six-minute barrier with a 558. In the meantime, Floatmeyer was running at the, in the 450s. McAllister kept getting better, too. I was closing the gap on her, but the closer I got, the harder it got. I'm on 342. Then, on the next to last meet of the season, going down the backstretch, I got closer to McAllister than ever before. I was so close, I could feel little cinder specks that her spikes were flipping back. Her hands were tight fists. Her hair was flapping like mad from side to side and slapping her in the neck. I could hear her breathing. She was kind of wheezing, grunting. And all of a sudden, right there on the backstretch, it came to me. Marceline McAllister wasn't faster than me. Not really. She was just trying harder. She was trying so hard it scared me. After practice one day, on the ninth, uh, one of the ninth graders, a slow ninth grader, grabbed me outside the girls' locker room and dragged me inside. He wouldn't let me out till I read what was on the wall. McAllister sucks trombones. See, he sneered, even the girls don't like her. I practiced hard in the days before the final meet, but not super hard. The problem wasn't in my legs, it was in my head. I knew I couldn't beat her now, but I didn't know if I wanted to pay the price. And the price was pain. I found that out, out following her down the backstretch that day. I was really hurting. My legs like they felt, I'm sorry, my legs felt like they were dragging iron hooks through the cinders. My head was flashing and thundering, but the worst part of all was my chest. It felt like somebody opened me up and laid two iron shot puts inside me, one on top of each lung, and each time I breathed out the shot puts flattened the lungs a little more. By the last 100 yards, it was only about a thimble full of air to suck from. When I remembered all that pain and realized that it would have to get even worse for me to go faster, I wasn't sure beating her was worth it. I felt like somebody somewhere double-crossed me. I couldn't believe I would have to try so hard just to beat a girl. The day before the meet, Floatmeyer gave me a little punch in the shoulder. Last chance, he said. When they called the milers to the start, me and McAllister, as usual, being 7th graders and the slowest, lined up at the back of the pack. Only this time, somebody else lined up with us. It was pain. He was grinning. I swore right there that that would be the last race I ever ran in my life. In all my other races, what I did was stay pretty far behind McAllister for the first two or three laps. That way I could save my energy and sprint after her on the last lap. But this time... I stuck with her right from the start, like a wart. I'm on page 344. By the end of the first lap, I was already blowing hard. My legs were getting a little heavy. Pain didn't touch me yet, but he was right beside me, still grinning. We were really smoking. We kept it up the second lap. Didn't slow down at all. Her spikes were practically nicking my knees. Our breathings had the same rhythm. At the half-mile mark, things started to get a little scary. Never before, this far into the race, were we this close to the leaders. I was almost as tired already as I usually was at the end of the whole mile. Something had to give. Pain was right there, stride for stride, grinning away. Something was going to happen. It did. Coming off the first turn into the back stretch of the third lap, the leaders started to go faster. McAllister's, McAllister speeded up, too. She was trying to stay with them. She's crazy. I had no choice. I had to go, too. I stepped on it, and all of a sudden, Payne wasn't alongside me anymore. He was on me. He was beating up on my head. He was pulling on my legs. He speared a cramp him to my side. He opened up my chest and dumped in those two iron, iron shot puts. Little by little, McAllister pulled away. Three yards. Five yards. Ten yards. When she leaned into the far turn, I got a side view of her. She was running great. Long strides. Arms pumping. Leaning just a little forward. Keeping her form. Everything the coach told us. A feeling I never expected in a million years came over me. I admired her. I was proud of her. I knew she was hurting too, maybe even as bad as I was. But there, was, there she was, gaining on the guy in front of her. I wanted to be like her. The gun went off. Last lap, 440 more yards and my racing career would be over. I reached out like my own breath was a twisted rope and pulled myself along. My lungs sagged under the shot puts. I tried to forget what I, sh I shook 
I've tried to forget that. <clears throat> I shook my arms to relax. Stride long, head steady, keep your form. I don't know whether she slowed down or I got faster, but the gap between us closed. Ten yards, five yards, three yards. We were on the final backstretch, and I was where I started, nipping at her heels. Now, I thought. I pulled alongside her. Floatmeyer and some others were already sprinting for the tape, and we were on our own private race, crunching down the cinders, gasping like asthmatics, side by side. We never turned to look at each other. Then, going into the final turn, she started to edge ahead, a couple inches, a couple feet. I went after her. My lungs disappeared. Only the shot puts now. And now, they were doing something. I'm on page 346. They were getting warm. They were getting hot. They were burning. I caught her coming off the final turn, side by side again. There was no form now. No nice, fresh strides. With every step, we staggered and knocked into each other like cattle coming down a chute. I wish I had the shot puts back, because in my chest now was something worse. Two balls of white-hot gas. Stars. A pair of stars in my chest. A billion degrees centigrade. And there were, they were expanding, exploding, searing hot star gas, scalding into my stomach and arms and legs, into my head. My eyes were star gas. Faces on the side lurched and swayed. The track wobbled under my feet. Elbows, shoulders, hips colliding. If Peter was running with me, I didn't know it. I couldn't see. I couldn't hear. I couldn't breathe. I was dying. I don't know when I crossed the finish line. I only know they stopped me and held me up and dragged me around with my arms draped over their shoulders. Somebody came over and slapped me on the back. Way to go! It was Floatmeyer's voice. Why? I gasped. You beat her, man! I opened my eyes. Floatmeyer was grinning and holding out his hand. I was too weak to slap it. I sort of petted it. Then there were hands coming down from everywhere. I did my best to hit them all. Way to go, Herc! They kept saying. Way to gut it. Way to run. Good race. Good race. Good race. Finally, I plopped to the ground. Little by little, I got my shoes off. My chest was... Returning to normal, the star gas must have gone out through my eyes. They were burning. Another hand, palm up, in front of me. I slapped it. I looked from the hand to the face. It was McAllister. She looked sick. Her lips were bluish and wet, and her mouth was crooked. But then it smiled. Good race, she said. All right, so now after this story, you can I'll listen to it again if you want, um, or go back and listen to parts. Sorry about the cough <laughs> or losing my places. But um, uh, now you need to go to uh, Google's Classroom, and there'll be a worksheet there for you to answer some questions and then uh, submit it to me. Okay? All right, guys. Thanks for listening.